Today is May 8th. I'm Serena, and welcome to the Seven Streams Bible Reading Method. We're in the Nation Stream today, reading from the book of 2 Samuel. Now, if you remember, last week, David got caught up in a little bit of a mess with Bathsheba, had her husband Uriah killed, and now we're going to hear the aftermath of this event. We're covering chapters 12 to 15 today. We're reading from the easy-to-read version this week. 2 Samuel chapter 12 The Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan went to him and said, There were two men in a city. One man was rich, but the other man was poor. The rich man had lots of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little female lamb that he bought. The poor man fed the lamb, and the lamb grew up with this poor man and his children. She ate from the poor man's food and drank from his cup. The lamb slept on the poor man's chest. The lamb was like a daughter to the poor man. Then a traveler stopped to visit the rich man. The rich man wanted to give food to the traveler, but he did not want to take any of his own sheep or cattle to feed the traveler. No. The rich man took the lamb from the poor man and cooked it for his visitor. David became very angry with the rich man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this should die. He should pay four times the price of the lamb because he did this terrible thing and because he had no mercy. Then Nathan said to David, You are that rich man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I chose you to be the king of Israel. I saved you from Saul. I let you take his family and his wives, and I made you king of Israel and Judah. As if that had not been enough, I would have given you more and more. So why did you ignore my command? Why did you do what I say is wrong? You let the Ammonites kill Uriah the Hittite, and you took his wife. It is as if you yourself killed Uriah in war, so your family will never have peace. When you took Uriah's wife, you showed that you did not respect me. This is what the Lord says, I am bringing trouble against you. This trouble will come from your own family. I will take your wives from you and give them to someone else who is very close to you. He will have sexual relations with your wives, and everyone will know it. You had sexual relations with Bathsheba in secret, but I will punish you so that all the people of Israel can see it. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, The Lord will forgive you, even for this sin. You will not die. But you did things that made the Lord's enemies lose their respect for him, so your new baby son will die. Then Nathan went home, and the Lord caused the baby boy who was born to David and Uriah's wife to become very sick. David prayed to God for the baby. David refused to eat or drink. He went into his house and stayed there and lay on the ground all night. The leaders of David's family came and tried to pull David up from the ground, but he refused to get up. He refused to eat with these leaders. On the seventh day, the baby died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the baby was dead. They said, Look, we tried to talk to David while the baby was alive, but he refused to listen to us. If we tell David that the baby is dead, he might do something bad to himself. David saw his servants whispering and understood that the baby was dead. So David asked his servants, Is the baby dead? The servants answered, Yes, he is dead. Then David got up from the floor. He washed himself. He changed his clothes and got dressed. Then he went into the Lord's house to worship. After that, he went home and asked for something to eat. His servants gave him some food and he ate. David's servants asked him, 
Why are you doing this? When the baby was alive, you cried and refused to eat. But when the baby died, you got up and ate food. David said, While the baby was still living, I cried and refused to eat because I thought, Who knows, maybe the Lord will feel sorry for me and let the baby live. But now the baby is dead, so why should I refuse to eat? Can I bring the baby back to life? No. Some day I will go to him, but he cannot come back to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. He slept with her and had sexual relations with her. Bathsheba became pregnant again and had another son. David named the boy Solomon. The Lord loved Solomon and sent for Nathan the prophet to give Solomon the name Jedidiah. So Nathan did this for the Lord. Rabbah was the capital city of the Ammonites. Joab fought against Rabbah and captured it. Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have captured its water supply. Now bring the rest of the army together and attack Rabbah. Capture this city before I do, or else it will be called by my name. So David gathered all the soldiers together and went to Rabbah. He fought against Rabbah and captured the city. David took the crown off their king's head. The crown was gold and weighed about 75 pounds. This crown had precious stones in it. They put the crown on David's head. David took many valuable things out of the city. David also brought out the people of the city of Rabbah and made them work with saws, iron picks, and axes. He also forced them to build things with bricks. He did the same thing to all the Ammonite cities. Then David and the army went back to Jerusalem. David had a son named Absalom. Absalom had a very beautiful sister named Tamar. Another one of David's sons, Amnon, was in love with Tamar. She was a virgin. Amnon wanted her very much, but he did not think it was possible for him to have her. He thought about her so much that he made himself sick. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shemaiah. Shemaiah was David's brother. Jonadab was a very clever man. He said to Amnon, You are the king's son, so why do you always look so sad? Tell me what the trouble is. Amnon told Jonadab, I love Tamar, but she is the sister of my half-brother Absalom. Jonadab said to Amnon, Go to bed. Pretend you are sick. Then your father will come to see you. Tell him, please, let my sister Tamar come in and give me food to eat. Let her make the food in front of me. Then I will see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down in the bed and pretended to be sick. King David came in to see Amnon. He said to King David, Please, let my sister Tamar come in. Let her make two cakes for me while I watch. Then I can eat from her hands. David sent messengers to Tamar's house. They told her, Go to your brother Amnon's house and make some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon. He was in bed. Tamar took some dough, pressed it together with her hands, and cooked the cakes. She did this while he watched. Then Tamar took the cakes out of the pan and set them out for him. But he refused to eat. He said to his servants, Get out of here. Leave me alone. So all his servants left the room. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom and feed me by hand. So Tamar took the cakes she had made and went into her brother's bedroom. She started to feed Amnon, but he grabbed her hand. He said to her, Sister, come and sleep with me. Tamar said to Amnon, No, brother, don't force me to do this. Don't do this shameful thing. Terrible things like this should never be done in Israel. I would never get rid of my shame and, and people would think that you are just a common criminal. Please, talk with the king. He will let you marry me. But Amnon refused to listen to Tamar. 
He was stronger than she was, so he forced her to have sexual relations with him. Then Amnon began to hate Tamar. He hated her much more than he had loved her before. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out of here. Tamar said to Amnon, No, don't send me away like this. That would be even worse than what you did before. But Amnon refused to listen to Tamar. He called his servant and said, Get this girl out of this room now and lock the door after her. So Amnon's servant led Tamar out of the room and locked the door. Tamar was wearing a long robe with many colors. The king's virgin daughters wore robes like this. Tamar tore her robe of many colors and put ashes on her head. Then she put her hand on her head and began crying. Then Tamar's brother Absalom said to her, Have you been with your brother Amnon? Did he hurt you? Now, calm down, sister. Amnon is your brother, so we will take care of this. Don't let it upset you too much. So Tamar did not say anything. She quietly went to live at Absalom's house. King David heard the news and became very angry, but he did not want to say anything to upset Amnon, because he loved him since he was his firstborn son. Absalom began to hate Amnon. Absalom did not say one word, good or bad, to Amnon, but he hated him because Amnon had raped his sister, Tamar. Two years later, Absalom had some men come to Baal Hazor to cut the wool from his sheep. He invited all the king's sons to come and watch. Absalom went to the king and said, I have some men coming to cut the wool from my sheep. Please come with your servants and watch. King David said to Absalom, No, son, we will not all go. It will be too much trouble for you. Absalom begged David to go. David did not go, but he did give his blessing. Absalom said, If you don't want to go, please let my brother Amnon go with me. King David asked Absalom, Why should he go with you? Absalom kept begging David. Finally, David let Amnon and all the other king's sons go with Absalom. Then Absalom gave this command to his servants, Watch Amnon. When he is drunk and feeling good from the wine, I will give you the command. You must attack Amnon and kill him. Don't be afraid of being punished. After all, you will only be obeying my command. Now, be strong and brave. So Absalom's young soldiers did what he said. They killed Amnon, but all of David's other sons escaped. Each son got on his mule and escaped. The king's sons were still on their way into town, but King David got a message about what happened. But the message was, Absalom has killed all the king's sons. Not one of the sons was left alive. King David tore his clothes and lay on the ground. All of David's officers standing near him also tore their clothes. But then Jonadab, the son of David's brothers, Shimea, said, Don't think that all the king's sons were killed. Only Amnon is dead. Absalom has been planning this from the day that Amnon raped his sister Tamar. My lord and king, don't think that all of your sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Absalom ran away. There was a guard standing on the city wall. He saw many people coming from the other side of the hill and went to tell the king. So Jonadab said to King David, Look, I was right, the king's sons are coming. The king's sons came in just after Jonadab said that. They were crying loudly. David and all of his officers began crying. They all cried very hard. David cried for his son every day. Absalom ran away to Talmai, son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. After Absalom had run away to Geshur, he stayed there for three years. King David was comforted after Amnon died, but he missed Absalom very much. Joab, 
son of Zeruiah, knew that King David missed Absalom very much. So Joab sent messengers to Tekoa to bring a wise woman from there. Joab said to this wise woman, Please pretend to be very sad. Put on sackcloth. Don't dress up. Act like a woman who has been crying many days for someone who died. Go to the king and talk to him using these words that I tell you. Then Joab told the wise woman what to say. Then the woman from Tekoa talked to the king. She bowed with her face to the ground. Then she said, King, please help me. King David said to her, What's your problem? The woman said, I am a widow. My husband is dead. I had two sons. They were out in the field fighting. There was no one to stop them. One son killed the other son. Now the whole family is against me. They said to me, Bring us the son who killed his brother, and we will kill him, because he killed his brother. My son is like the last spark of a fire. If they kill my son, that fire will burn out and be finished. He is the only son left alive to get his father's property. So my dead husband's property will go to someone else and his name will be removed from the land. Then the king said to the woman, Go home. I will take care of things for you. The woman of Tekoa said to the king, Let the blame be on me, my lord and king. You and your kingdom are innocent. King David said, If anyone is saying bad things to you, bring them to me. They will not bother you again. The woman said, Please, use the name of the Lord your God and swear that you will stop these people. They want to punish my son for murdering his brother. Swear that you will not let them destroy my son. David said, As the Lord lives, no one will hurt your son. Not even one hair from your son's head will fall to the ground. The woman said, My lord and king, please let me say something else to you. The king said, Speak. Then the woman said, Why have you planned these things against the people of God? When you say these things, you show you are guilty because you have not brought back the son who you forced to leave home. We will all die some day. We will be like water that is spilled on the ground. No one can gather this water back from the ground. You know God forgives people. God made plans for people who are forced to run away for safety. God does not force them to run away from Him. My Lord and King, I came to say these words to you because the people made me afraid. I said to myself, I will talk to the king. Maybe the king will help me. The king will listen to me and save me from the man who wants to kill me and my son. The man just wants to keep us from getting what God gave us. I know that the words of my lord the king will give me rest, because you are like an angel from God. You know what is good and what is bad, and the Lord your God is with you. King David answered the woman, You must answer the question I will ask you. The woman said, My lord and king, please ask your question. The king said, Did Joab tell you to say all these things? The woman answered, As you live, my lord and king, you are right. Your officer Joab did tell me to say these things. Joab did this so that you would see things differently. My lord, You are as wise as God's angel. You know everything that happens on earth. The king said to Joab, Look, I will do what I promised. Now, please bring back the young man Absalom. Joab bowed with his face on the ground. He blessed King David and said, Today I know that you are pleased with me. I know because you have done what I asked. Then Joab got up and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. But King David said, Absalom must go back to his own house. He cannot come to see me. So Absalom went back to his own house, but he could not go to see the king. People really bragged about how good-looking Absalom was. No man in Israel was as handsome as Absalom. 
Every part of his body was perfect, from his head to his feet. At the end of every year, Absalom cut the hair from his head and weighed it. The hair weighed about five pounds. Absalom had three sons and one daughter. Her name was Tamar, and she was a beautiful woman. Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two full years without being allowed to visit King David. Absalom sent a message to Joab asking for permission to see the king, but Joab refused to come see him. So Absalom sent a second message to Joab. Again, Joab refused to come see him. Then Absalom said to his servants, Look, Joab's field is next to my field. He has barley growing in that field. Go, burn the barley. So Absalom's servants went and started a fire in Joab's field. Joab got up and came to Absalom's house. He said to him, Why did your servants burn my field? Absalom said to Joab, I sent a message to you. I asked you to come here. I wanted to send you to the king to ask him why he asked me to come home from Geshur. I cannot see him, so it would have been better for me to stay in Geshur. Now let me see the king. If I have sinned, he can kill me. Then Joab came to the king and told him what Absalom said. The king called for Absalom. Absalom came to the king and bowed low on the ground before the king. The king kissed him. After this, Absalom got a chariot and horses for himself. He had fifty men run in front of him while he drove the chariot. Absalom would get up early and stand near the gate. He would watch for anyone with problems who was going to King David for judgment. Then Absalom would talk to them and say, What city are you from? They would say they were from such and such tribe in Israel. Then Absalom would say, Look, you are right, but King David will not listen to you. Absalom would also say, Oh, I wish someone would make me a judge in this country. Then I could help everyone who comes to me with a problem. I would help them get a fair solution to their problem. And if anyone came to Absalom and started to bow down to him, Absalom would treat him like a close friend. He would reach out and touch him and kiss him. Absalom did that to all the Israelites who came to King David for judgment. In this way, Absalom won the hearts of all the people of Israel. After four years, Absalom said to King David, Please, let me go to Hebron to complete a special promise that I made to the Lord. I made the promise while I was still living in Geshur in Aram. I said, If the Lord brings me back to Jerusalem, I will serve the Lord in a special way. King David said, Go in peace. Absalom went to Hebron, but he also sent spies to all the tribes of Israel. They told the people, When you hear the trumpet, say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Absalom invited two hundred men to go with him. They left Jerusalem with him, but they did not know what he was planning. Ahithophel was one of David's advisors. He was from the town of Gilo. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he invited Ahithophel to join. Absalom's plans were working very well, and more and more people began to support him. A man came in to tell the news to David. The man said, The people of Israel are beginning to follow Absalom. Then David said to all of his officers who were still in Jerusalem with him, Come on, we cannot let him trap us here in Jerusalem. Hurry up, before he catches us. He will destroy us all, and Jerusalem will be destroyed in the battle. The king's officers told him, We will do whatever you tell us. King David left with everyone in his family, except ten of his slave women. He left them to take care of the house. The king left with everyone in his house following him on foot. They stopped at the last house. All the king's officers passed by him, and all the Carathites, all the Pelathites, and the Gittites, six hundred men from Gath, passed by the king. The king said to Itai from Gath, 
Why are you also going with us? You are a foreigner. This is not your homeland. Go back and stay with the new king. You came to join me only yesterday. You don't need to wander from place to place with me. Take your brothers and go back. Go with my faithful loving kindness. But Itai answered the king, As the Lord lives, and as long as you live, I will stay with you in life or death. David said to Itai, Then come, let's go cross Kidron Brook. So Etai from Gath and all of his people and their children crossed over Kidron Brook. All the people were crying loudly. Then King David crossed over Kidron Brook, and all the people went out to the desert. Zadok and all the Levites with him were carrying the box of God's agreement. They set down God's holy box, and Abiathar said prayers until all the people had left Jerusalem. King David said to Zadok, Take God's holy box back to Jerusalem. If the Lord is pleased with me, he will bring me back and let me see Jerusalem and his temple. But if he says he is not pleased with me, let him do whatever he wants to me. The king said to Zadok the priest, You are a seer. Go back to the city in peace. Take your son Ahimaaz and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. I will be waiting near the places where people cross the river into the desert. I will wait there until I hear from you. So Zadok and Abiathar took God's holy box back to Jerusalem and stayed there. David walked up the path to the Mount of Olives. He was crying. His head was covered, and he went without sandals on his feet. All the people with David also covered their heads and were crying as they walked with him. Someone told David, Ahithophel is one who joined in Absalom's plot against you. Then David prayed, Lord, I ask you to make Ahithophel give only foolish advice. When David got to the top of the mountain, he bowed down to worship God. Then David noticed Hushai the archite. Hushai's coat was torn and there was dust on his head. David said to Hushai, If you go with me, you will be just one more person to care for. But if you go back to Jerusalem, you can disagree with Ahithophel and make his advice useless. Tell Absalom, King, I am your servant. I served your father, but now I will serve you. The priests Zadok and Abiathar will be with you. You must tell them everything you hear in the king's palace. Zadok's son Ahimaaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan will be with them. You can send them to tell me everything you hear. So David's friend Hushai went back to the city, just as Absalom arrived in Jerusalem. Dear Jesus, forgive us for having lapses in our discipleship, suffering for it, only to muse, why is this happening to me if God loves me? We know, God, you do not bring or wish or want evil upon us. It just happens in this life. Our disobedience has invited evil into this world. May the things that bring us pleasure make us grateful and the pain that we experience to be more prayerful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In chapter 12, God needed to use a parallel story told by a trusted friend to get to David. As we said before, David had less ethics when he was sober than Uriah did when he was inebriated. The sheep story from Nathan crushed David, who finally came out of his moral coma. David did not feel the change coming over him as he took in one wife after another. But subconsciously, somewhere along the way, he thought, I can because I want, I want because I can, and I can because I am the king. If David had paused long enough, he would have been reminded that taking Bathsheba from Uriah was coveting, stealing, adultery, and murder. Strangely enough, David had lapsed, thinking the Ten Commandments didn't apply to him. But his realization started him on the road right back into God's presence. David was quick to confess and repent. Psalm 51 and 32. 
However, this sin of David's started an avalanche that haunted him the rest of his years. He had Uriah murdered, and soon murder visited his own home. He let lust take him to places he shouldn't go. Lust therein took over others in his family. He had sex with Bathsheba in secret, thinking it would be kept hidden. Soon, his wives were ransacked in public on the rooftop. From this day on, the sword would never leave David's home. This translation says that he would never have peace in his home. And to close this sad saga, the baby David gave to Bathsheba dies. Afterwards, Solomon is then born. The chapter ends with a war victory, but it feels less victorious in the wake of David's violations. In chapter 13, David's troubles amplify as his firstborn son, Amnon, seduces and rapes one of David's other daughters and Amnon's half-sister, Tamar. Absalom, Tamar's brother, also one of David's sons, plots to kill Amnon for his deed of raping his sister. Two years later, Absalom arranges for Amnon to be killed. All of David's other sons escape in fright, and then Absalom becomes a fugitive in hiding in Geshur for three years. The drama is thickening in David's family. He must have dreamed of days gone by when dinner hour was a joyous event. Not anymore. The consequences for David's transgressions are visiting him for what he had done, line by line. In chapter 14, Absalom was afraid to come back to Jerusalem. David seemed reticent to fetch him or even call for him to come back. It's sad, but the reality is that David's resolve during his valiant deeds and battles of yesteryear don't seem to be there anymore. Joab pulls together a scheme that spurs David enough to call for Absalom to return to Jerusalem. Absalom returns, but he is quarantined, and he doesn't get to visit the king, his own father, for two more years. Absalom gets frustrated, and finally, he lights Joab's field on fire to get some attention. This finally triggers an arrangement for Absalom to visit his father in the palace for the first time in five years. The overdue meeting finally happens. In chapter 15, Absalom was not satisfied and develops a plan. He soon began the role of self-appointed arbitrator so as to turn affections from King David to himself. Absalom was a huckster, and evidently a good-looking one at that, and people were not able to see through him. He asks his father permission to go to Hebron, but is not forthcoming as to what his real plans are. Absalom goes, takes 200 men with him, and he even gets Ahithophel, one of David's confidants, to join him in the rebellion that is incubating. David hears what is really happening and seems to resign, and simply leaves Jerusalem taking his household with him. It's a sad affair, and many are weeping aloud. They pause and insist that the Ark of the Covenant be taken back to Jerusalem, and David would come back if he felt God prompted him to do so. It's really sad how David has become so aimless in character. He is disturbed to learn that Ahithophel is against him now too. He sends messages that he is willing to follow Absalom as the next king. And his messengers arrive back in Jerusalem just as Absalom arrives from Hebron. What's going to happen now? We'll find out next week. SevenStreamsMethod.com is the home port for this podcast. Thank you for joining me today in this very dramatic story that we have in the life of King David. Tomorrow we'll transition to the Wisdom Stream, where we will read more of David's work. And know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Until tomorrow, I'm Serena, sailing with you down the Seven Streams.